One of the biggest complaints about David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest is that a lot of the main plot points and ideas never resolve themselves. And people get up in arms over this almost 30 years later. And today, we are going to hear from David Foster Wallace about why he decided to make this decision. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace here on YouTube. I already have a playlist of a ton of Wallace videos down below if you are interested. And let us now hear from Wallace. Quote, I've been asked a whole, whole lot why. After making the reader kind of climb this big hill, does Infinite Jest not wrap up? The book, actually, for me does resolve, but it resolves sort of an outside the right frame of the picture. You can get a pretty good idea, I think, of what happens. I think, for the most part, I'm just like all writers. I want to do stuff that feels real to me. And so stuff that's been very heavily used in commercial entertainments that are very neat and slick and sophisticated are probably going to strike me as not real, and I'm going to avoid them. And probably in some cases, that's a problem because there are certain types of artwork that should wrap up neatly. The visceral knee-jerk, oh God, if it's ever been done in a commercial thing, I shouldn't do it. It's probably something of a limitation. I hope I don't have that all the time. We've been conditioned by commercial entertainment to have some form of resolution because even in TV shows or movies where there is a cliffhanger or some weird symbolic ending, there is a ton of resolution before that point. The most famous example of this, I think, is The Sopranos. You know, the end of that show ends in blackness. And it's hinted and thought that there was a hit put on Tony Soprano, but we don't exactly know. But everything else in that show had been resolved. A lot of the, the main characters had died. There was a, a Rico case against Tony. There were a ton of other problems brewing. So he was going to get screwed no matter what. But with Infinite Jest, there is a big problem. And that's for most readers, it's going to take 45 to 60 hours to read Infinite Jest. Because when you watch something like The Sopranos that has, what, six or seven seasons, you put in 50, and 50 or 60 hours to, into that show. But you just get to veg out. You can be walking around, stretching, um, drunk, high, whatever, as you were watching that show. And you can miss a lot of things. And it's not going to be that big of a deal. But to read and comprehend Infinite Chess requires a ton of brain power, a ton of focus. You can't be multitasking or even at the coffee shop necessarily, unless you have like headphones on, and focus on a book that sometimes has walls of text that feel impossible to read because you were just bored out of your mind. And what's interesting about the complaints that say that Infinite Jess don't resolve is that when I think about the people who would make that type of complaint, I think they are very ignorant of reality because... All of us have a ton of unresolved open loops. For instance, about 10 years ago now, my best friend went off the grid. I don't know if he's dead. I don't know how to contact him. No one knows where he's at, even his parents. I'm not going to sit here and hire a private investigator or get weird. But I have no idea where this guy is. Our storyline and all the crazy stuff we did and our plans and our dreams just suddenly ends. And when I look at my life and many other things, there is no logical resolution. Sometimes the resolutions that have happened are so irrational that you can never put it in a book because people would say that's unrealistic. And so I really do believe that we've been so conditioned that we don't view fiction or movies or whatever as actually a depiction of reality because obviously they are a simulacra and are fiction. But when we talk about the greatest movies or literary, uh, literary fiction novels of all time, they are hyper-realistic. I just had an addict tell me today that Infinite Jest helped him more through their addiction than any other piece of knowledge, that Jordan Peterson or the big book in, in Alcoholics Anonymous weren't realistic enough, didn't show them the actual unique struggles of addicts and get inside their minds enough to help them. When we read, for instance, Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, it is a hyper-realistic depiction of what happened in the West. There was scalping and pedophilia and rape and racism and, you know, anything else um, that you can imagine as evil. And so there are two types of people who demand that Infinite Jest needs to be resolved or it's a lesser novel because these things don't resolve. And the first are obviously people who are just addicted or expect everything to be like commercial entertainment. And that's not a surprise, whatever. But the second group is really interesting. And I've seen this time and time again, that it's the logic bros, the engineers, the left brainers that can't handle things not getting resolved. Because like I said earlier, 
if you relax into life and don't try to control things too much and live authentically and growth oriented, you will unfortunately have a ton of open loops. But people who are super logical or too much in their head and have a ton of anxiety want every single one of those loops resolved. And they most of the time don't take action in objective reality to resolve those loops. Like they're not going to go hire a private investigator to go find their best friend. But they're going to tell a story in their head that makes sense to them and start to believe it eventually as truth. It's the craziest thing. And it's because they've never opened their hearts to the mystery of life, which is the most scary thing of all, to admit that you don't actually know, that you don't know if you're going to heaven or why you and your best friend don't talk or any of these open loops that you personally have. Because the eventual end goal to close one of these open loops in a conscious slash holistic way is to surrender to it and just let it go. I don't know what happened to my best friend. I don't really think about it anymore. And I've actually never mentioned that on this channel before. It occupies very little space in my mind. But what's also funny about the logic bros is that most of the time, they are some of the least growth-oriented people in the world. Because when you look at Infinite Jest, it makes some proclamations. It really can transform your life because every single one of you out there has addictions right now. And for whatever reason, you don't want to solve them. I'm hold holding on to a bunch of my own also. It could be codependency, a YouTube addiction, like things that you may not think are a big deal because you're not injecting heroin into your veins, but they are still affecting your dopamine system and your ability to see uh, reality correctly all of the time. But if I had to pick an addiction to have, it would have to be reading and writing. And for all of my reading addicts out there, I run a Write Conscious book club, an Infinite Jess course, a writing group, and post a ton of my own writing and stuff over on the Right Conscious Substack. We are unlike any other booktuber or educational community on the internet. I talk daily with you guys in my office hours. I write daily with you guys and increase our portfolio. And my big project over the next couple of years is to create the most comprehensive course of, on Infinite Jest ever created. By the end of this year, whenever you are watching this, it's 2024 now, it, the Infinite Jest course will be over 100 hours. And if it's not 2024, I'm going to read Infinite Jest every single year from a different perspective. So experts and newbies are all welcome. And I am also going over all of David Foster Wallace's books in the David Foster Wallace course and reading seven other books in the Right Conscious Book Club. So if you guys don't have any money or just don't want to support, I understand and I also have a ton of free content over on the Substack if you are interested in that. So the link is down in the description below and let us get back to the video. And Wallace confronts us with this in the first chapter of the novel. And what I'm going to say really isn't a spoiler. I'm not gonna reveal anything, except I'm just gonna say it now, here we go, that we don't know why Hal and Condenza can't talk anymore. There are theories and there are some clues sprinkled throughout, but we never get a definitive answer why he's so disconnected from the, you know, the ability to speak. We never see that clear jump happen, at least to my knowledge. And like I said, there's th some things that happen, but we never see that directly. And that's the first thing, that's the first mystery, and it's on the first page. But with Helen Condenza, the least important thing about him in the entire novel is why he can't speak anymore. The most important thing about Hal, and this not, isn't really a spoiler, is his family trauma. How the other events that have happened in his life to screw him up. The crazy sins of the father energy and some of the interconnectedness and the spirituality related to how Those are the things that really matter. And we get more than enough of those in Infinite Jest with every single other unclosed loop or open loop, and that sounds way better, um, with Don Gately and Joel and the terrorist organization, the master copy of Infinite Jest, the movie. But each one of those pockets I told you about, if viewed correctly, if contemplated, will give you a glimpse into addiction, entertainment, politics, beauty, loneliness, and many other aspects that are the most important things really in the world. And it's being done in a fiction novel, which is really, really hard to do. And I think people don't want to focus on that. And the conversation around Infinite Jest has always surrounded, you know, what happens here? How do I figure this out? But the easiest parts of the novel are the most transformative. Like, for instance, there's a section where you hear from a bunch of people in AA. It's like you're almost in 
an AA meeting, but you get the maximalist, maximalist postmodern version from David Foster Wallace, which makes it way better. You don't have to go to a meeting with crummy snacks and coffee. And even if you're not an addict, like I'm never probably going to go to a recovery meeting, but I've experienced what I've need, needed to experience and started to understand the 12 steps and how they work and why they are important. And the problem with overthinking and so many other things just by reading, you know, a hundred or 200 pages on it from Wallace. And when you think about it, it's really funny because when you read a book on the 12 steps or on addiction, how many pages is it? Sometimes they're 400 pages or so. But Wallace spends almost a full book, you know, explaining addiction from a totally different angle without the bullet points, without the game plan and the playbook, but the actual on the ground internal feeling and the characters who are involved in addiction. And that's something else I love about Infinite Jest is that it deals in the extremes. We have, for instance, a terrorist organization with handicapped, you know, handicapped people in it. We have the most outlandish and crazy addicts I've ever seen in literature. We have the Incandenza family, which is the most, mo the biggest motley crew of just weirdos and people who are most likely autistic that I've ever seen. But to play devil's advocate here, I do wonder why, Mac uh, not McCarthy, excuse me, Wallace decided to make this decision in the first place. Was it just some shock jock postmodernist stuff that he wasn't going to give us some of these resolutions? Because there is a lot of open loops and him resolving them all would be weird, but Maybe it could be really impactful to see some of these loops resolved, to see where some of the addicts or the people end up, to know why Hal becomes uncommunicative, because there are so many kids now with anxiety. As a teacher, I can no longer do anything that involves speaking because 60% of the class plays the anxiety card and will give me a doctor's note saying that even though there's nothing technically wrong with this person, they just can't get, uh, talk in front of a class for 60 seconds, even read a note card. So for those who have read Infinite Jest or are working through it right now, is some of this non-resolution annoying to you? Or do you think it adds to the magnitude and quality of the work? In my humble opinion, opinion excuse me, I think it adds to the work, as I've hopefully explained in this video. But I understand if you have differing thoughts, and I would love to read them down below. Have a great day, and I will see you in the next video on Wallace tomorrow.